Let's talk about input-output tables. What are they and how can we use them? Input-output tables tell us about the flow of goods within the economy. For each industry in the economy, those show which other industries supply its inputs and which other industries use its outputs. You must imagine a matrix, a grid of rows and columns. Each column and each row represent a different industry. Let's pick one industry, say processed food, and look along its row. As we move across the columns, each cell shows the amount of output from the processed food industry that is bought by each other sector. For simplicity, let's show not the actual value of the transaction, but the value as a percentage of the total sales. Many cells within the matrix will have a zero. We start with the primary industries like mining, which does not use food as an input. Then we go to manufacturing activities, most of which, like iron and steel, don't use food as an input. But as we move across, we come to the processed food industry itself. It uses processed food as ingredients to make other foods. So there's a big figure there, let's say 20%. Moving further, we pass industries like electricity and water, zeros there too, as they do not use food as an input. Then we come to the service industries, business services like banks and insurance, so zeros again. And then to personal services like entertainment. There's a figure there because processed food is bought by restaurants and food vendors. Let's say they use 20% of the output. Then there's processed food bought and consumed directly by people. We call that final household demand and it's often the biggest use. Let's say it's 50% of the total. Then there's food that is exported. In this case, local users have already accounted for 90% of the value of output, so that means there is 10% left over for exports. And the last column is the sum of all the others, so 100% of the value of production. That's the output side. The input-output tables also show us from where processed food gets its inputs. And we do so by this time looking down the column headed by processed food. Unsurprisingly, a major source of inputs comes from the agriculture sector. It's typically about 25% of the total. Then there's the processed food sector itself. It accounts for 20% of the total inputs, just as it did 20% of the total outputs. It makes sense. The value of all inputs is the value of output. And what processed food sells to itself is what it buys from itself. The manufacturing sector provides other inputs too, typically packaging from the paper industry and sheet metal for tins and glass for bottles, say 10% and machines for mixing and making food, say another 3%. Then there's lots of little inputs like electricity, water, etc., maybe 4%, and business services, 3%. Then comes people again, this time not as purchasers of output, but as providers of inputs in the form of labour and capital, and paid as wages, say that's 15%, and profits, let's say that's 12%. This input from people is what economists call value added. And finally, on the input side, is imports of processed food, which in this case would be 8%, again adding up to 100% of the value of production. The last step is simply to recognise that if we did this procedure for all the industries in the economy, we would fill in the matrix, and that would be the input-output table. Okay, that's what they are. Now, how can we use an input-output table? There are two main uses. Firstly, we can use them to understand the structure of the economy, and that can help us target our assistance efforts. Input-output analysis can help identify opportunities to strengthen linkages within the economy. We can see where imports enter the economy, and that can help us identify replacement opportunities. And if we see a small number in a cell when we expect a big one, that suggests an opportunity for expansion. And not just any expansion, but one that will help the using industry as well as the supplying industry. Input-output analysis is also useful in understanding export industries. 
they are able to compete in foreign markets because they use imports efficiently and we can see which industries are supplying those inputs. Secondly, we can use input-output tables to assess the impact of some change. Let's say the food processing industry expands by 10%. We know from the table that its supplying industries must then also expand, not by 10% exactly, but by 10% minus the import component. And the industries that supply those supplying industries must also expand by 10% minus the import component. And this process goes round and round, each time with a leakage to imports. There are algebraic techniques that allow us to add up these rounds, at least until they get too small to worry about. And the full impact of this expansion is the so-called multiplier effect of the initial change. So input-output tables give us a means to model change in the economy. That's quite a lot for one little 